Welcome everybody to Clean Support the Front Line. We're just going to give a few minutes as people join us on their Zoom link. So uh, welcome and come in. Um, and I'll do a little introduction once we've got the numbers coming up. So welcome to everyone. You are in the right place if this is what you're expecting. Clean Support the Front Line from UCAD. Uh, this is day two, and whether you came yesterday, whether you're just coming for today, you're very welcome uh, with us. So um, I'm just going to wait for a few more people to join in and then um, outline the session and how it's going to work and why we're doing it. So I'll just wait for a few more people to join us. Um, give it a couple of minutes for the magic of the internet to work. Which is great. So keep coming in. Welcome to everybody who's joining. More people are coming on, which is really good. This is gonna, this is our second day, and uh, we do have hopefully have a recording available for the first day. So if anyone has just joined for the second day um, and would like to see some. Um, video of the earlier webinars, we can also provide that as well. Okay, so um, I'll start with the introduction and I'm sure that will give uh, enough time for people to join um, for our first session. So hello and welcome to everybody. This is UCAS Clean Sport the Frontline um, conference, which we are undertaking virtually over two days. As I said before, if you heard me when you came in, this is the second day of our event and um, it's got a slightly different focus for the first one. So who this is aimed at really is for um, practitioners in sport. We're particularly looking at people that work with athletes on a day to day basis. So you might be an educator, a physio, a nutritionist, a strength and conditioning coach, a performance analyst, a lifestyle advisor, a coach. Um, an administrator. We're also interested in welcoming people from the research and academic community. So if you're coming from a sports um, science background, um, you're very welcome as well. Hopefully what we're going to do today is provide some stimulating sessions on uh, various different topics which we think are of relevance at the moment in the anti-doping um, community. My name is Emily Robinson. I'm currently the interim chief executive of UCAD. Um, I was at the conference last year in my other role as director of um, strategy and education. So uh, welcome today. Um, you'll have seen hopefully UCAD strategic plan, which is putting much more emphasis than before on um, research, innovation, um, and insight. We want to spend more time and resource bringing together and maximizing data and knowledge that's held both within our organization, but also to connect with different parts of the sporting system that are already undertaking research into this area. So research and um, innovation is gonna be a bigger focus for us than before. So we're really pleased to be doing these sessions and hope that you'll get really engaged and involved uh, sending us your ideas and questions. So how it's going to work today, as I'm sure many of you are very used to these Zoom webinars, um, we'll have a Q&A function. So if you've got any questions uh, for our speakers as we're going along, please put those into the Q&A function. And then my colleague Charlie will come in and put the questions to the speaker at the end of each session. So rather than wait to the end of the day for all the questions, we'll be taking the questions at, after the speaker has finished. We have got a hashtag if you want to join in the conversation, um, which is hashtag CSFL 2021. And feel free to post questions or thoughts or ideas to us on our social media channels, uh, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. And we will be recording the session and that will be available for people over the coming days. So we've got a really packed, interesting and varied agenda today, covering different range of subjects. We're looking at CBD. We're looking at evaluating values based education. There's going to be a particular session on para athletes. And then we'll be finishing by looking at um, intelligence um, and how um, you can work with us to bring more intelligence into 
UCAD. Um, some great speakers, some UCAD speakers, some external experts and um, athletes. So I think we are ready to start and I'm going to hand over to Professor Graham Close from Liverpool John Moores University for our first session on CPD. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just share my screen now. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that uh, okay, and if not, somebody will shout, no doubt. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you today. Uh, this is a probably the hottest topic I've seen in sport nutrition in, in my 20 years of working in, in the discipline. And brilliantly for today, being a UCAD you know, conference, I think the major controversy is all at the moment around the anti-doping and the anti-doping risks associated with supplementation. And that's what I'd like to, to cover today, to give you a little bit of a background behind it and then get into the concerns that I have as an academic, but also as a practitioner who's currently working with elite sports. So in, in terms of some declarations of potential conflicts of interest, these are the various organisations that fund research in my laboratory. And the one to really point out for today is Nature Can, who is a CBD company that is sponsoring research in my lab at the moment. If you want to read a little bit more on this, you can free to download these Gatorade Sports Science Exchange articles where I covered the safety concerns, uh, the athletic claims in this article. And if you'd prefer to just switch off and get the information from a, an infographic, well, there you go, Asker, you can drew, summarize my, my knowledge in a nice little pretty picture that you can use a, so I want to cover quickly today in my 20 minutes or so four things. I want to start off by looking at what actually is CBD. Uh, I then want to move on to the evidence that athletes are turning to it. But the really important thing today, I would think, would be the, the anti-doping concerns and why I'm particularly concerned at the moment. And then finally finish with what I was advised we should be saying to our athletes at the moment. Uh, and what we cannot do, though, is put our head in the sand and just hope that this is going away, because trust me, this is not going away. OK, so if we start off at the, at the beginning to ask the question, what actually is CBD? Uh, what is the legal status of it and what are the suggested benefits? And, and I could speak all day on this, but I'll try and summarise it pretty quickly. And before we try and understand CBD, I think it's un, important to understand the, the cannabinoid system. So we know that the human has its own endocannabinoid system, whereby it plays really important roles in the human body, briefly described as relax, eat, sleep, feed, and protect. And the body has two major endocannabinoids, one called anandamide and the other one, two, arachidonol glycerol. And what we now know is that exogenous uh, cannabinoids, so the type of cannabinoids that we're taking from the diet, uh, has the ability to interact with our body's own endocannabinoid system, which can have profound effects on the human body. And we've got these cannabinoid receptors all around the body. So you can see that CB1 receptors mainly found in the brain and CNS, where CB2 receptors spread much more throughout the human body and have major physiological effects. If we think about the, the cannabis plant, and I know that if there's any botanists on the audience today, we can debate this for a long time. But broadly speaking, the cannabis plant can be separated into the sativa and the indica variety. The sativa uh, is commonly referred to as hemp, where the indica variety is often referred to as marijuana. And I think we all know the main reason that marijuana is grown, whereas hemp is developed for a variety of purposes. The main difference between the two strains is the amount of the major psychotropic cannabinoid, THC. So to be classified as hemp, it needs to be less than 0.3% THC, where the, the indica strain can be as high as 30% THC. And we know that there's a, a huge array of uses for the hemp plant, whether, whether it's um, the seeds that are used in foods, 
whether it's the leaves that are used to create things like CBD, uh, the stalk or the stem that's used in, in industry, in textiles, in, in making clothing, in making building material, you know, or the roots, again, that have got reported medical benefits. And over the last few years, largely in a sport perspective because of a stance that WADA took on CBD in 2018, it's become a multi-billion dollar industry. And you can see that it's predicted to be worth 20 billion by 2024. And I, I can't think of any other industry that seven or eight years ago I'd not heard of that is now worth $20 billion. And now what we're seeing is the emergence of CBD in everything whether it's CBD biscuits, CBD coffee, CBD gummies, the main route, which is the tinctures, the tablets. And my favorite one that I saw recently is CBD pizza. So we're, we can even get it into pizzas now. So that must, as if you couldn't make pizza any better, we now put CBD in it. So it's appearing in, in all walks of life. And our athletes are bombarded almost on a daily basis with this product and are being told the importance of it and how good it is for the health and performance. I think it's important to cover at this point the legal status of CBD. And the legal status is very complicated and it varies country to country. Broadly speaking, if it comes from hemp, so it's come from a plant that has less than 0.3% THC in it, and it's not been making any over medical claims and it's been sold as a, a supplement, at the moment in the UK, it's legal, although there's a couple of caveats on that. The first one is that there must be less than one milligram of THC. Remember, that's a major psychotropic cannabinoid in, in the final bottle. And the probably biggest change over the last couple of years was a decision to classify CBD as a novel food. And a novel food is anything that wasn't in the food chain in substantial amounts prior to the 15th of May, 1997. And there's a variety of examples of novel foods, such as new source of vitamin K, um, krill oil, uh, chia seeds, uh, and, and a variety of foods that have been classified as novel food and have come through this regulation. So the deadline date for companies selling CBD to submit the novel foods application has now passed. And although these have not been signed off and agreed, if you haven't had your application uh, validated as being submitted and uh, approved at this stage, even though it's not finally approved, at the moment, there are the only companies in the UK that are allowed to continue to sell it. The US legislation is even more complicated, and I think it's worth a little mention because a lot of our athletes do travel uh, overseas, well, they certainly do in, in non-COVID times. And people have misunderstood the 2018 Farm Bill in America. And the 2018 Farm Bill was a bill that was passed to allow hemp to be used in agriculture. And when you read information from the FDA, you can see that it clearly states here that the passage of the 2018 Farm Bill has led to a misperception that all products made from or containing hemp, including CBD, are now legal to sell. So it would appear that in America, yes, hemp was removed, which allowed hemp to be used in textiles and agriculture. But actually, that doesn't mean that CBD is no legal to sell. The FDA, FDA do state, however, that the, the major concern of companies that are making unsubstantiated therapeutic claims. Now, make sure, remember that there are no approved therapeutic claims associated with CBD which has basically led to the belief that in America, you can sell it as a supplement, providing you don't say anything that it may or may not do. So it's basically selling a bottle that says, this is CBD. And the complexity in America stems a little bit from the fact there's also legislation there, whereby if a supplement has been classified as a drug, which CBD has been licensed as a drug in the form of Epidiolex, which is prescribed to, uh, to treat various forms of epilepsy, it cannot then be reclassified as a supplement. And that's why it being sold as a supplement has problems in America. It gets even more complicated when you think that in, in America, we've got state by state laws as well as federal. So if you look at places like um, 
South Dakota, Iowa, and Idaho. In these states, CBD is still classed as illegal. If you look in other states, such as uh, Oregon, Wyoming, North Dakota, we can see here just about South Dakota, here it, it's fine. We're, we're, we're allowed to sell it. Although bear in mind what I said before about the unsubstantiated claims. And then there's other states, uh, such as Washington at the top left, Montana, where it's allowed providing it's not in food. So the, the complexity of the legal status um, I think is beyond any other supplement that we have to deal with in, in sport nutrition. And I think it's really important to understand that because I know of at least one example of someone from the UK who has got in a lot of trouble in a US airport. Because remember that even though you might be in a US airport in a state that has said, yes, airports are under federal jurisdiction. So then it's another level of complexity. So the legal status of CBD is a lot more complicated than what we've perhaps been led to believe. I won't have time to go into this in any detail today, but I just did a Google search like all athletes do of CBD and athletes. And the first hit that I got, uh, bear in mind there's 1.7 million hits in 0.48 seconds, was six benefits of CBD for athletes. So straight away it's suggesting that it relieves pain um, it's an alternate to NSAIDs, it's an alternate to opioids, it reduces inflammation, it settles your gut, and it can improve your sleep. If athletes are reading this, is it any wonder that they're wanting to try it? The second hit that I got was an article from Skiing and Snowboarding, where it was suggesting the top tips to recover. And the first one is painkillers, then an ice pack, and the next one is CBD. So it's becoming major advice. So we know that painkiller addiction is a big problem in sport at the moment, particularly in contact sports. And given that CBD claims to reduce pain, and there is some evidence from the main literature rather than the sport literature, I can see why athletes are interested. It also claims to improve sleep. And again, there is some evidence, particularly if the poor sleep is anxiety related, that it may be beneficial in, in this context. And there is evidence around it um, helping with muscle regeneration, albeit this is mainly in cell and, and rodent models. And a, a real hot topic in sport at the moment is that there's suggestions that the endocannabinoids, that including CBD, may be a promising therapeutic uh, intervention for concussion and traumatic brain injury. So real important aspects that are, are crucial in sport and that's why I'm, I'm not surprised that athletes are turning to it. Which takes me on to my next section about our athletes actually using CBD at the moment. And we only need to look at a few websites. You know, this is an article by actually a good friend of mine, George Cruz, um, from my work with him at England Rugby, who is explaining why rugby players are taking it. And George actually has his own brand, 4-5 CBD. I was watching the football uh, a couple of weeks ago now, and I just had to take this picture because this must be the biggest ad that I have ever seen in a football ground for CBD. And it, we cannot then deny that athletes are being exposed to marketing as well as um, claims that at the moment that are unsubstantiated. So we wanted to have a look at this. So with uh, one of my PhD students, Andy Casper, we managed to recruit over 500 professional players to ask them, are they using CBD, professional rugby players, this league and union? And if so, why? So the, the headline message from this paper was that 26% of all the players had either previously or were currently using CBD. But maybe more interestingly, if we look at the age demographic, in the over 28, it was over 40%. We looked at it on a team-by-team -team basis. And what you can see here is while some teams had very low, very low use of it. Other teams were up towards a 70% usage. So 70% of the players either currently or previously using CBD. Now, this is probably down to key influencers within a team. So this is one of the assistant coaches of one of the teams that we recruited. And we can see Lee here uh, advertising fit CBD on his social media and saying that he's feeling great results and here's a discount code to buy it. So it's probably no surprise that if the coaching staff are recommending it, that players are turning to it. 
But what was really worrying from this study that we did was the fact that 70% of the players were getting the information off the internet and only about 18% from a nutritionist or medical staff. So they're not turning to us for information in a very high risk category. And why do I believe it's a high risk category? Well, we know, everyone in this room should know it, by the way, but in 2018, WADA decided in its wisdom, and you'll sense the irony in my voice there, to remove it from the prohibited list. But I really don't think WADA thought this through, and I don't think they even understood cannabinoids, synthetic, uh, hemp-based, uh, and the issues associated with isolating CBD. So they confirm that it's not a cannabinoid mimetic and it's not prohibited under Section 8 cannabinoids, but we should be aware that when it comes from a plant, it may contain prohibited. And the market now is like the Wild West. And this was a paper from Gurley et al. where they looked at the content versus the label claim. And the headline act here is that only three of all these products, were with, of the 25 products, were within 20% of the range Five had no CBD whatsoever, so a complete waste of money. 16 were contaminated with uh, harmful synthetic cannabinoids. A number of them had too high a level of THC, but prohibited, uh, sorry, the, the, the psychotropic cannabinoid. Um, so there's major issues with what, we, what we're buying. But when we look at the, the word of wording in a little bit more detail, they are really clear that all natural and synthetic cannabinoids are prohibited except CBD. And I wonder when they remove CBD, did they really realize that within the cannabis plant, yes, you might isolate it to CBD, but there will be trace amounts of the other 140 cannabinoids, which according to their wording are prohibited substances. And a recent paper from the UK looked at some of the other cannabinoids in 29 commercially available CBD oils. And worryingly, yes, we can see the THC is in there, which is the one which should have been removed, et cetera. But look at all the other cannabinoids. All of these in theory are prohibited by WADA. So where THC is a threshold compound at 150, with a, a cutoff limit of 180 nanomoles per liter, all the other cannabinoids, according to my understanding of the WADA code, would be prohibited in any amounts. So is this a risk for athletes? So a controversial statement at this point, but in my opinion, WADA must now clarify if the trace amounts of the minor non-psychotropic cannabinoids, such as CBG, would result in an anti-doping rule violation. The current stance is simply unhelpful and confusing in what is a very confused world. So we really need, in my opinion, some clarity about these minor cannabinoids. And when it comes to THC, what we also don't know is the small amounts that are allowed in the bottle, so less than 0.3%, are these a problem for athletes? Because we know that it accumulates in fat tissue. And there's evidence from the mainstream cannabis literature that people who have been cannabis users and then um, withdraw after a period of, of fasting, you get a reintoxication of THC, presumably from storage within fat tissue. And a similar paper showed that, in again, in cannabis users who have withdrawn from cannabis, after exercise, they got a, a spike in THC, um, again, presumably from fat storage of THC. So was this only too easy to predict that we're already now beginning to see sanctions associated with CBD? This one in, in skiing and this one in triathlon. Another major problem, and I believe this was discussed yesterday, is at the moment only BSCG, as far as I know, will batch test a CBD product. Yet BSCG will still batch test a product that has the minor cannabinoids in. So there's a batch test on products which in theory could still fail an anti-doping test if WADA are looking for the other cannabinoids. And my understanding is when, when asked, they will say, well, we could, but they don't say they do. Perhaps the answer is this. So we've seen that USADA have removed marijuana even from, from the UFC, and soon after that followed the NBA. And only this morning, as I was flicking through BBC Sport, 
I can see that WADA itself is looking into whether cannabis now needs to be removed from the um, from the prohibited list, and maybe that is the answer that cannabis itself would need to be remo removed. But in the current situation, in my opinion, it is such a high risk product at the moment. So we're going back to basics, and this is where we're lucky to have some funding from Nature Cam, and they're happy for me to to grow cells in various concentrations of CBD to actually look at what it's doing from a, a muscle re response regeneration perspective. But also we're going to look at some of these anti-doping risks by in non-WADA uh, athletes, giving them uh, CBD, so it, you know, in non-tested student population and seeing if any of these minor cannabinoids um, appear and do they accumulate and is it as, as much as a risk as what I suspect it is so to conclude what do we advise our athletes today well I'll, I'll summarise it as six things we have to have the conversation it's not going away anything that's worth so much money will not go away we need to explain the sports specific anti-doping rule violation risks and explain to them why we also need to explain the safety concerns that I've not gone into today and the lack of data on that. We need to discuss the evidence and let them know that at the moment, sports specific evidence isn't there. And then I think we need to help with alternate strategies and then wait for the research or wait for WADA to actually try and clarify this very, very confused field. So on that note, I'd like to finish by thanking the CBD research group at Liverpool John Moores. We're now a team of six and two external collaborators at the Lambert Initiative and thank Nature Cam for, for funding the ongoing research in my group. And thank you for your attention. And I will try and answer any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Graham. That's, um, that's fascinating. And like you say, it's, it's definitely a topic which, which we come across very regularly um, through our interaction with athletes. So uh, I think that, um, some of that clarification has been really helpful. Uh, one question that has come in is is just asking what your I know you said there about the the steps that we that we should be taking in terms of the athlete interaction at this stage. If there was if there was one bit of advice that you're going to be passing on to athletes, how would how would you um and um, what would that be really, and 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 how would you sort of um, address that on a on a, on an individual basis to to yeah. an athlete if they came to you? Do you know? If someone asks me about the thinking about trying it, at the moment, my advice is don't, because it's just too many unanswered questions and the evidence isn't there. The challenge I have, Charlie, and this has happened to me on occasions, is where an athlete has told me they're using it, it's got them off opiate-based pain medication, they feel healthier as a person for doing it, and they're not in pain anymore. Mm. What do I give that athlete? What advice do I possibly give that athlete? Because... Do I advise them to go back onto medication, but it's probably got higher risks, higher side effects and more addictive when they found an alternate? At the moment, I believe WADA have put me in such a situation I have to, but I do resent the situation that I've been put in, mm. that they've removed the product, but in my opinion, removed it in a way that doesn't allow anyone to give any genuine advice to an athlete of how, how they may be able to use it safely. Yeah, I think that's that's um, that's reflected in in, in the advice that, that comes across to um, to athletes as well. So, uh, would a positive test from the use of CBD oil um, used to be treated as a, would be treated as the same as a positive for recreational, i.e., welfare use? I think that would be. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if that's one, quite one for you, Graham, but maybe more one for the sort of the results team. Yeah, um, I think that's probably more for, for, for you guys. But the fact that what we're yeah. looking for is THC, I don't know how they would differentiate whether that THC has come from the <laughs> CBD product or from um, the, the cannabis itself. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Great stuff. Okay. Um, and I'm just trying to look through at the same time as well as the, the latest update from, from WADA, from a WADA press release around um, changes to any prohibited substances. Um, but I don't think that's one for, for, for right now. But so what I'll do is I'll just say I'll just say thank you very much indeed, uh, Graham. But and uh, if we do get any more questions, what we'll uh, what we'll do is we'll try and 
get those answered as we as we as we go on and uh, and get those back to you. But thanks again, Graham. That was uh, that was a fascinating insight and um, quite a lot compacted into your twenty minute slot. So congrats on uh, on squeezing all that in. Um, so we're going to move on now to uh, Dr. Ian Bordley from the uh, University of uh, Birmingham, who's going to uh, pick up the next session with a um, with Paul uh, Moss from UCAD uh, at the end as well. So handing over to you, Ian. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. I'll just share my screen so I've got the slides up. And then hopefully we can get started. So hopefully everyone can see that. Okay. Um, yeah, so good good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so this piece of work that I'm going to present um, over the next sort of 20 minutes or so is a piece of work that was commissioned by UCAD to develop a survey to monitor and evaluate education sessions within the new LMS system that um, we've heard about yesterday. Uh, so it's an anti-doping education platform that's going to deliver um, education. Um, uh, through the internet and remotely. Um, so before I get started with the presentation, I just want to take this opportunity to um, thank my collaborators on this project. So Martin Chandler, Sue Backhouse, Andrea Petrosi, uh, and Laurie Patterson, who have all been you know, involved in this project at all stages um, of the work, from when we put the initial bid in to when we delivered the final report. And, um, and also thanks to, to UCAD and the team there as well, because this has very much been a piece of research that's been co-produced uh, and UCAD, we've collaborated with UCAD um, at all stages, and I think that's um, really benefited the project and, and why it's been a successful project, in my opinion. Um, so we'll get started with the actual presentation. Now, what I want to do first is just quickly show you the, uh, the project specification that, that UCAD um, put together. So this is what they're asking for. So basically, they, they wanted the survey to be based on uh, validated and reliable tools, so predominantly based upon existing measures um, that, that have shown to be appropriate um, in the literature. Uh, secondly, they wanted to make sure that it was a fully anonymized, um, so people could answer in confidence without risk of being identified or um, deductive disclosure, uh, disclosure um, so we couldn't, we couldn't trace back to individuals. It was much more targeted uh, and being developed for a consensus viewpoint. So we could look at what the effect on a group that's perceived a certain type of education uh, has been. And we could look before and after education delivery to see what the effect on certain psychological variables and um, types of knowledge um, have been as a result of the education delivery. Uh, and that would help with the effective monitoring uh, and evaluation of those education sessions and therefore inform future education as well and development of education. And that's something that I'll reflect upon as we go through in terms of you know, different elements that, the server that will help with that informing future education. Um, and finally, also to allow the opportunity to participants to express views and give feedback. So alongside the, the, the measures and the tools that we've included in the survey, there are also numerous opportunities for sort of qualitative feedback that again gives that sort of depth of information, that richness that allows uh, future education delivery to be informed by that. And I'll, I'll touch upon um, some elements of that in the presentation today. But we are predominantly focusing on some of the tools and uh, measures that we've incorporated in the survey. So, so, so building from that specification, we add had three key objectives that we wanted to uh, achieve in the project. So the first of these was to develop an initial version of the survey that meets UCAD specification. So based on you know, that specification we just looked at, we developed an initial survey. Uh, once that was developed, we would then administer that to two separate samples. One of those is a, was a convenience sample that we could collect quickly. Another one took more time, but it was a specific sample, sampling from the population that will be engaging most with the LMS um, system. And what we wanted to do with those two samples was to examine the validity uh, and reliability um, of the different measures that we've incorporated in there. And then finally, to make some decisions around which of those measures needed to be included in the final version. So this was the third objective in terms of informing what the final version of the server would look like. So it might be possible to remove some of the initial measures to make it more concise uh, for, for the actual implementation within the LMS. 
So if we go on to look at the actual timeline for the project, so we, we started the work uh, towards the end of January uh, and in uh, early February, we were developing the survey. So when we put our bid together for the uh, initial project, we had an initial design of the survey, but then we built upon that design in collaboration with UCAD to um, sort of tailor it completely to, to what, um, what UCAD required um, and added in one or two elements at that point. Um, and the overall, as we'll look at in a moment, the overall structure of that uh, survey design was built around the international standard for education to make sure we had measures and tools in there to uh, to capture all the different elements of education within that international standard. And once we had that initial survey the, across February and March, we uh, initiated the first data collection, which was done via an online research platform, very much a convenience sample that we could. Uh, collect the number of assets from the number of assets that we required um, to to check the validity and the reliability of the measures, but also to test how long it was taking people to complete the different elements um, to make sure that we weren't getting drop off because of the length of the survey, for example. Um, so, uh, and once we'd completed that collection, we analysed the data. Once we were happy with the data from that initial collection. We then uh, initiated the second data collection, which was very much done through uh, the majority collected through UCAD and the national governing bodies um, to access the actual athletes at the sort of higher the national international level that would be using the LMS uh, down the line. So we had the data um, from the actual population of interest. So just a little bit more on term, in terms of the overall design. So I mentioned there the international standard for education. So we've got these elements. You can see on the screen now uh, of the international standard. So firstly, in terms of values-based education, we included several attitudes measures. I'll, I'll talk about those a little bit more in a moment. But alongside that, we also included some non-attitudinal measures um, to, to capture the breadth of the sort of um, psychological variables you'd be looking to influence through value-based education. Uh, alongside that, we also um, incorporate something to, to capture awareness raising, another element of the international standard. Um, and what we developed here was a clean sport education experiences measure that captures people's or assesses people's awareness of particular campaigns that, um, that UCAD might be uh, promoting at certain times. Thirdly, we, in terms of information provision, we wanted to make sure that the, the quality of information and the delivery of information was leading to changes in people's knowledge and anti-doping. Um, so we developed and incorporated an anti-doping anti knowledge test. Uh, and then finally, in terms of anti-doping education, we measured uh, perceptions of legitimacy of the anti-doping system, but also in terms of uh, normative obedience, so people's perceptions of the importance um, of adhering to anti-doping anti rule, uh, rules and regulations. But alongside that, we also included a measure of um, prevalent use of non-prohibited and prohibited substances and methods so that we can look at some of the actual behaviours that put people at risk of uh, an anti-doping rule violation. Um, and so that, that was the final measure that we included. So to, to move on to the, uh, the, the actual collections, in terms of the participant demographics, uh, if we look at gender, firstly, uh, across the two collections, so as I already mentioned, the, the, the collections did differ in terms of size, and I think because of the proximity to the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games, um, it was quite challenging in terms of collecting the, for the second data collection. But in terms of gender balance, you can see that it's um, roughly the same sort of balance across the two collections. So the overall numbers are different, but percentages are similar in that. We've got roughly a third female, but um, more males than females. But where we see the real differences, I think, and, and this is important for some of the things we'll look at today, um, where we see the differences on the athlete pathway and the competitive level. Uh, in that first convenience sample, majority of recreational athletes, and then we're seeing reducing numbers as we move through the athlete pathway. When we look at data collection two, we see the opposite, where we've got the lowest numbers in the recreational and talented, and then progressive uh, increase in numbers um, as we move to national and international. And that allows us to make some comparisons across those samples uh, in terms of the mean scores for some of the different measures, because we would expect the second data collection, this to be athletes who have experienced much more um, anti-doping education and clean sport education um, to, to date. So if we want to look at some of the findings from uh, our analysis, and this really is just a, a sort of a, uh, a snapshot of the, uh, all the analyses that we did, uh, the ones that I've selected are the ones I think that are of most interest 
uh, to this audience, but firstly in terms of value-based education and the attitude measures that we've put in. Um, so we've got the performance enhancement attitude scale, which is the most widely used doping attitude scale in the literature. Uh, but we also included, if you look, look to the right here, in terms of evaluation and activity, um, some semantic differential scales. And they're, they're also quite commonly used in the anti-doping uh, literature. So we wanted to make sure we were, we were including those measures because they're the ones that are most commonly used. Um, but uh, And what we see across those three is that uh, we've got generally low levels in uh, of evaluation of um, uh, how appropriate dope is and people's attitudes towards it. So generally, you know, um, quite negative evaluations of doping, which is a, a positive thing um, for us and very reassuring. And across the two samples, slightly lower levels um, of evaluation of, uh, of doping in terms of the attitudes for the more elite um, sample. But what we also included was a measure that distinguishes between the functional attitudes and the moral attitudes. Uh, and this is important because um, it, it, the, the functional attitudes are very much about people's perceptions of how effective doping is. And this is seen as a real risk factor for doping is that if athletes feel that the more that an athlete feels as though doping is uh, effective, the more that they might be tempted to actually uh, utilize it to enhance their performance. So what we've included here is a measure that we've been developing, validating over recent years that distinguishes between those functional attitudes and also the moral attitudes that, you know, how morally opposed to doping are, are athletes um, and, and separates those two out. And what we see here is that for the functional attitudes, um, fairly low uh, perceptions of the functionality of doping, um, but lower levels, importantly, for the more elite second sample. And then when we look at the moral attitudes, we see that in, in both groups, there's, there's quite high levels of moral opposition to doping, but again, um, high levels uh, of moral opposition, and so morally against doping for the um, for the more elite second sample. So again, quite reassuring values, but also supporting the ability of these measures to sort of separate out these different uh, types of attitudes, but also to distinguish between um, different athlete groups. And then. You Still staying on values-based education, we also included three other measures that were non-attitude measures. So first of these was doping self-regulatory efficacy. So this is uh, an athlete's perception of their ability to resist internal and external pressures uh, to dope. So how confident are that they can resist those pressures? Uh, and uh, quite high levels of, of confidence here for both groups and slightly higher levels for the, the more elite group. So um, reassuring in terms of the, the scores for that first one. Um, Secondly, in terms of doping willingness, this is about athletes' willingness to dope when they're put in situations of real vulnerability. So, for example, when they're um, injured or coming back from injury, um, which is a known risk factor uh, or risk period um, for doping. Uh, and what you see here is quite low levels of, of doping willingness in both groups, but again, the, the lower levels for the more uh, elite samples, so distinguishing between uh, the two samples uh, there again. And then on the final one, um, doping moral disengagement is about an athlete's ability to, to rationalize and justify um, engaging in doping. So it, it, what we've seen from the attitudes is that on the whole, athletes have a quite high moral opposition to doping, so they, they don't see it as something that's acceptable. So if athletes are going to engage in it, they're going to need to find ways to rationalize and justify doing it. So this is an important measure to include to, to capture that. And what we want to see here is a very low levels of people's ability to rationalize. And this was on a seven point scale. So those scores indicate quite low levels um, of rationalizing um, doping. Uh, and again, the lower levels in the, in the second sample, um, which is overall more elite across the two. So again, uh, all of these and, and the interrelationships between these different measures suggesting it's, it's important to include these three separate measures alongside um, capturing the attitudes. So if we move on to look at um, awareness raising, um, so what this is about um, within the international standards is about highlighting key topics and issues. So it's very, uh, very timely, this is time sensitive. So it's when particular um, issues within anti-doping need raising, then there might be a particular campaign behind it from different national from national anti-doping organizations. So what we did here is we developed a way 
uh, of measuring awareness of these campaigns that could then be tailored to the particular campaigns. So in collaboration with UCAD, we identified three recent campaigns that we could use in the testing of the survey. And these were the, the, the guide that they'd released on the major changes to the 2021 code, the protective sport campaign and the squeaky mascot campaign. And what you can see here is that we're seeing quite marked, especially for the first two campaigns, differences between the first sample and the second sample. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we would expect that this second sample have um, had much more exposure to um, anti-doping education and therefore should have greater awareness of these campaigns. And that's what we're seeing with these measures is that we're seeing these high levels of awareness um, uh, for, the, um, for the second sample compared to the first sample. Not so much for the, the, the final one in terms of the squeaky mascot campaign. I think what you can also, what is also important is over time we've built uh, an evidence of what the sort of normal levels of these scores would be um, for campaigns. And that will inform you can in terms of um, how successful particular campaigns have been in raising awareness. And that could in, uh, inform the way in which they um, deliver uh, future campaigns as well. But alongside these um, quantitative this quantitative measure, we also incorporated the opportunity for qualitative feedback. So this was one of the areas where we the open responses, and we found that we got lots uh, of very useful information through that, and uh, including the second sample with those that will be regularly using the LMS. Um, so this supports the usefulness of including those open responses and again very useful comments that could um, feed into development of future campaigns. In terms of information provision, so this is about providing accurate up-to-date anti-doping material but also interesting is making sure that um, when that information is provided um, that athletes are actually taking it on board uh, uh, and internalizing that and it's developing their knowledge. Um, so what we wanted, the way in which we assessed this was to develop a, a, a test of, of 20 item true false responses. But what we wanted to make sure was that this test wasn't too easy, but also that it, it wasn't too difficult as well. So we were hoping for scores somewhere around the midpoint or maybe just above. And what you can see here is uh, across both the samples, that's where we were getting the sort of uh, the mean scores for the different um, uh, different points in the athlete pathway, and, and overall a, a general pattern towards uh, increasing levels of knowledge uh, as we move through the athlete pathway and athletes are being exposed to more anti-doping and clean sport education. So supporting the usefulness and the um, sensitivity of this test um, to detect differences. Obviously, the one exception to that is the recreational athletes in the second sample, but I mean, just. Uh, as a reminder that there's just eight athletes in that subsample. So, you know, some of these comparisons with the very low um, subcell numbers, um, we just need to be aware that those are not going to be necessarily um, reliable estimates for, for the, that population, but it does allow us to look at some general trends across the two samples. But what you can also do is look at the individual questions um, that were in the test um, to look to see which are the easiest questions, the ones that everyone's getting correct. Um, potentially something that we could look to swap out if we want to make the test more difficult, but also informing maybe that less um, education focus needs to be around that topic, but maybe needs to be directed towards some of the questions where we're seeing common misunderstandings and lots of athletes are getting the, the questions uh, wrong, as we can see for the, uh, the four other questions over on the right there. Um, with this in terms of the sort of the range of your know, range of difficulties in terms of the overall uh, bank of questions but it would be possible in the future as well to different to develop different banks of questions for different groups so say if athlete support personnel were using the lms we could develop um a, or tailor this set of questions to a particular group or, or athletes at different levels within the athlete pathway and then finally, in terms of anti-doping education, what we want this is about delivering high quality anti-doping training. Uh, there's a, a couple of things that we wanted to look at here. But firstly, we want to, what we're expecting is that when some people are receiving very effective anti-doping education, that should increase their perceptions of legitimacy of the anti-doping system. But it should also increase their normative obedience, so their perceptions of the importance of rules and regulations. Um, so what we wanted to do, first check was that we needed to have both measures in so they were capturing something separate. And as you can see, 
here we've got the patterns in there across the two, but we also looked at the relationships between the, the two measures and what we saw in both samples, where in the first sample, a very weak relationship between the two, and in the second one, no correlation between the two measures at all. So highlighting the importance of measuring both and supporting the fact that they're measuring uh, something separate um, from one another. Also, th there's no real pattern in terms of across the athlete pathway for legitimacy, whereas we are seeing a general trend upwards in terms of the importance of adhering to rules and regulations as we move through the athlete pathway um, in general across the two samples. So supporting the importance and the usefulness of these two measures um, in looking at some of the effects of anti-doping education. But what we also wanted to do was um, to look at the prevalence uh, of use of uh, a series of prohibited uh, and, and, and non-prohibited uh, supplements, substances uh, and methods. Um, and uh, this is just a selection of some of the ones that we had in uh, in the survey that you can see are some of the, the, the key ones. But on the whole, what we saw for these prevalence estimates were generally in the sort of um, what was consistent with the literature. So what I'm showing here, the, the values for sample two in terms of the percentages. Uh, and what we are seeing is uh, generally um, consistent with the literature, again, highlighting um, that athletes are still engaging in behaviours that are putting them at risk of an anti-doping rule violation. So if we think back to yesterday's presentation by Terry O'Rourke, uh, around informed sport, and then Graham Close's recent um, uh, presentation that we've just had in terms of people's use of non-prohibited uh, uh, supplements, um, there's obviously a risk attached to those. Uh, and based on the prevalence that we're seeing here, then that highlights the importance of the education around people knowing how to put them to minimize the risk around inadvertent doping. But we're also seeing uh, people engaging in other behaviors that put them um, at risk of um, uh, anti-doping rule violations in terms of using prescription medications and prohibited substances and methods as well. Lower numbers, as you would anticipate, but still um, uh, uh, enough athletes to make uh, uh, this um, you know, something that want, we want to see reducing over time as a result of anti-doping education. And that's what we would be looking for on, on this self-reported use scale is looking for changes over time in, uh, in people's use. So there are all the, um, the, the key elements of the survey and some of the findings uh, from that. I'm going to invite Paul in to, uh, to join me now, um, who's going to sort of talk about some of the conclusions, but also about the implementation of the, uh, and of the uh, survey within the LMS. Thanks, Ian, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so looking ahead to the next steps of the project, it's clear from the findings that Ian has presented that they, there is support for the suitability of a series of short surveys to monitor and evaluate um, the education activities across the four ISC domains of education. So we're now at a stage where we have mapped all our education activities and interventions along the athlete pathway. Um, so we will continue to work with Ian and the rest of the team to align and determine the most appropriate scales that Ian talked about to the relevant intervention at the right time. As part of our ongoing monitoring and evaluation, we'll also assess the data periodically to determine whether our programs have had the desired impact um, and use this opportunity to make any modifications or improvements. In general, we we'll need to be carefully considering how we ensure we can make this as easy as and, and as accessible as possible for learners to complete without it seeming like an onerous task, having to complete multiple surveys um, resulting in survey fatigue. Uh, we'd also like as many responses as possible to each survey naturally. So this is something we'll need to uh, also give some consideration to about how we might actually go about that. We'll also need to work with our learning management system um, and, the, and the partner um, to determine the best ways of building these surveys into the Clean Sport Hub, which uh, if you were on the session yesterday with Becky, you, um, you would know a little bit more about that by creating the pre and post session surveys along with follow up surveys at a given point um, in time post education. So whether that's between three to six months um, following their uh, intervention to assess the level of knowledge retention there. So Ian's already um, thanked the research team, but again, on behalf of myself and on behalf of UCAD, I'd just like to extend the thanks there to, 
to everyone involved. Um, it was absolutely a collaborative effort. Um, and I think that was definitely um, a real benefit in, in getting to, to the point we are now. So that's all from Ian and myself. If there's time, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, if anyone's got any, if there's, if there's time. That's fantastic. Thanks very much indeed, both. Um, uh, just want to wait for a couple more questions to come through. I wonder if it's uh, it's one for Ian and maybe maybe Paul to, to chip in. So it might be a bit of a uh, provocative one coming from an education standpoint. But um, in terms of like the sort of prevention rather than you know um, uh, or catching through through testing, and is, um, is is that do you do you feel like there's a bit of a paradigm shift recently, maybe towards more of a focus on um, on, on trying to educate athletes throughout their um, careers rather than just relying on, on, on a testing program, which is seen as more traditional stalwart of anti-doping. Yeah, uh, so uh, I go first, Paul, yeah. Um, go for it, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, definitely in the sort of 10 plus years that I've been involved in sort of working in this area, we've definitely seen a, you know, a huge shift um, towards this. Um, I think we, the culmination of that has been the, uh, development of the international standard for education that we've seen uh, coming this year um, but we've also you know one of our earlier projects we've uh, conducted a, a scoping review of literature in this area and you can see the trend in the amount of research that's been conducted in this area but also the increasing numbers in the education teams uh, in national anti-doping organizations that are then utilizing that research evidence to to inform their practice um, and I th you mentioned there, Charlie, in terms of the athlete pathway and people at different athletes at different levels. I think if you know, I I was looking at the UK website earlier today, and you, you can see how education is being tailored and delivered to athletes at different levels, um, and recognizing the importance of, sort of early intervention as well. And uh, there's definitely more that we we need, and we're always wanting more investment. But um, we def things are definitely moving in the right direction. I think from our perspective. That's that's really interesting. puts puts it all into a bit more of a sort of a context of the of the, of the wider sort of timeline of anti-doping, I suppose. Uh, Paul, have you got anything anything to add on to, to to what Ian just said? I think Ian covered all the the main points there. I think from from our perspective at UCAD, I think we can see um, we can see this shift in in a number of our um, education programs and um, interventions and and how we're actually trying to educate further down the pathway whether that be at an, um, an athlete level or um, the, the practitioner level, the athlete sport personnel, trying to, trying to um, embed that education information and the awareness um, further down the pathway for those individuals. And, um, I'm not, not sure if you caught the session yesterday for, with, with Nikki Costa, who's um, helped set up our insight and innovations team. But if there was, and she, she talked a lot there about the, the availability for uh, research opportunities and we're you know essentially all ears for, for for submissions and ideas at this stage is is there anything that if you could you know wave your research funding wand that you would uh, that you'd want to commission immediately to get out I, I think the main thing that um we really need is um is more longitudinal research so we need the funding so the long-term funding uh, and funding for research groups that can stay together over a period of time um, to, to, to get more robust evidence and to look at what's happening over time in terms of athletes' development uh, and athlete support personnel in terms of their um, development and um, actually what point is it important to administer different types of education. And we'll only really be able to evaluate that by um, doing research over time, but that needs more long-term funding and high levels of funding to do that type of research. And, uh, and obviously more... Um, more funding for evaluating interventions as well. We're seeing a little bit more of that, but again, just going back to that scoping review that I mentioned, um, it is still a very small number of um, studies that are actually evaluating uh, education activities. So we definitely need more around that area. And Paul, would you would you agree with Ian there, or is there is there something that you've got up your sleeve that you're going to uh, spring on Nikki? <laughs> um, nothing up the sleeve at present, but it. Yeah, off the back of the last two days, it has got me thinking. Um, no, I, I definitely agree with Ian about the longitudinal aspect. Um, everything we're, 
that's been done in the past, you know, within this field has, has been very short term interventions or or semi uh, semi long term, if, if that makes sense. But yeah. I think, yeah, having something over a number of years, five plus years, uh, even longer would be would be would be really advantageous to have. Fantastic. Thank you both very much indeed. Uh, Paul, you can uh, go, and, go and put your feet up now and put the kettle on, but Ian, I'm afraid we're going to uh, require your input for just a little bit longer. We're delighted to uh, keep the next session off um, titled Understanding the Needs and Views of Para-Athletes and Support Personnel uh, Towards Tailored Clean Sport Education. Uh, and uh, we uh, have a, a great panel to join Ian, who's going to lead the, lead the discussion um, with uh, Andrea Petrosi. Uh, Paula Donovan from Sport Island and our esteemed uh, uh, para-athlete Ali Joad, fresh off the, uh, um, the flight from Tokyo. So we're delighted that, uh, that you, all four of you, can, can join us this afternoon. So I'll, I'll hand over to Ian to, to get things going. But just as a little nudge to, um, to those of you all watching, this, um, the, we, we will be looking for input from, from everybody as well. And, and you know, in, in the virtual um, conference world. This is the equivalent of the bit where people will be wandering around with microphones normally trying to get some interaction from the audience. So um, we've got a great panel. So don't be shy, get your questions on the group and um, I'll hand over to Ian. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, yeah, so um, this is a, a, a slight change of tack. So this is a different um, project that I'm involved with, but as you can see, uh, Andrea is involved again on, uh, in this piece of work. So this is uh, really um, a, a panel discussion that's centered around uh, an EU funded project called Respect P, um, which is a three year project that's looking at um, the, the needs in terms of education delivery for within power of sport, um, but also for athlete support personnel and particularly for athlete support personnel um, that are working with power athletes as well. So. You know, we've got we're quite a big group we're across um, six different countries um, across uh, Europe, but we've got a selection of um, members from the team today just to to get the researchers' perspective. So that's why we've got um, Professor Andrea Petrosi from Kingston University um, uh, uh, on the panel. But we want the practitioners' perspective as well. So I've got Paula Donovan from who's education manager from Sport Island. But we also want the, the athlete's perspective as well. So we've got Ali uh, Jared, who's, uh, as Charlie mentioned, fresh off the plane from, uh, from Japan. Hopefully he's back into our time zone now but, uh, and certainly back down. But um, yeah, we very much want the, the, the athlete's perspective as well on terms of the, in terms of the needs for um, um, education around para sport. Um, but I should probably mention that Ali's also a researcher and conducting his PhD at the moment as well. So he's... Um, and he's also one of our athlete researchers on the project as well. So he's um, yeah, very much can give an angle on the, uh, from the research perspective as well. So I've got um, a series of questions um, to, to sort of frame the discussion um, over the next sort of 40 minutes or so. But we do very much want questions from the audience as well. So I've got a, a starter question for, for each of our panel members, and then I'll just keep an eye on the Q&A. Um, and to see what questions are, are coming in. But yeah, if, I think in terms of the first question, and I think um, um, Andrea's got a slide to go with this one as well, but we were just hoping whether you could um, yeah, provide a summary of the literature relating to clean sport in Paris sport. And this is because you're leading one of the work packages for the Respect P project that, is conduct, that has been conducting a literature review around this area. Um, so I'll, I'll try and get that slide up for you as well. Um, I, I do have the slide because I made corrections, right. so if that's okay, I will I will share mine. Yep. That's okay. Fine. Thank you. Um, but but let let me introduce myself first. And uh, for those I don't know, it's hard to see the audience at the moment. But uh, I've been involved in anti-doping research for almost a twenty almost twenty five years now, including my PhD research back in early two thousand or even before. The reason why I mention this now is because looking at the literature on para sports and anti-doping, um, it's very, very uh, like what the situation was when I started to do my PhD and started to look around the PhD about 25 years ago, which, uh, which to, to summarize it, there is not much to summarize because it's very fragmented, a few papers, driven by probably personal interest uh, without much of a research agenda. 
in one way it's good because it can be shaped, but it's very, very difficult to summarize. So instead of a summary, I try to create a map. If I like to share my screen, I assume that you all see someone, please confirm that you see my screen. Thank you very much. I see Ali nodding. So what you see here is not a bad map, um, but the number of papers behind that is approximately somewhere around 25, maximum 30 papers, including reviews and empirical studies. To put it in context, um, and, and we, we narrowed down for about 100 papers and then selected 35. And before I go further, I need to mention that I'm working on this work package together with staff and students from Münster University. So the work I'm presenting is not just mine, but um, I, I received huge help from staff and students from Münster as well. So we. We identified about 100 papers that would be relevant uh, that talks about anti-doping, doping, doping uh, in para sports uh, in competitive level. But, and then when we narrowed down to empirical studies or reviews, which means we excluded all of the papers that are discussing what might be a problem, what might be a challenge, but without actually providing any answers or any empirical evidence. So to put that in context, uh, the 30 papers that we probably will end up including, um, one is going beyond the anti-doping rule violations, as you can see in the picture. But also, um, Ian can say that we are working on a similar um, mapping exercise for uh, non-para sport events. And the number of papers including there is around has 300. So that it's a tenfold amount of information and evidence available uh, in non para sports um, field. What's interesting is uh, what you see there is um, that, strictly speaking, anti doping rule violations, there are a few papers on testing, and that's limited to testing done at the Olympics and the para Paralympics Games in the past three years. Unlike you see elsewhere, the information provided by WADA through the laboratory reports and anti-doping rule violation reports are not used in research. This is an upcoming trend elsewhere, but uh, there is absolutely no evidence for that in uh, para sports or in relation to para sports. So there's a huge opportunity there uh, and a gap in the literature. The misuse of TV is actually a quite interesting because there's a lot of discussion around that it could be problematic because of the specific nature of the, uh, the, the athlete population. However, there is no empirical papers except one, and that one is only looking at uh, prescription or applied for TVs in para sports in comparison to sports. So that, that's, that's a quite interesting phenomenon that there people discussing that it could be a problem, but actually there is no research to back this up. And from there, we are actually moving on to something that is not strictly speaking doping, but often published or discussed in the context of doping and anti-doping. Two specific example is, I just labeled that as physical manipulation, but essentially what it's talking about is boosting, the one specific form. And the reference to that is often, it, this is a way to do doping without drugs. So they put that into the, the doping context. And the other one is classification manipulation, uh, which again, the, the problem with any mapping exercise is where you draw the line and how far you go, because some of the papers relevant to that is not specifically talking about misrepresentation, which is the deliberate cheating of misusing the system for gaining competitive advantage, but looking at what is the best way to do evidence-based misclassification. So it's, it's more of an interpretation whether we are trying to create a system that is hard to manipulate, uh, but it's not necessarily put in context with making it cheating-free or, or foolproof. Um, another area which is not necessarily connected to doping, but talk about technology and where we draw the line between enabling versus enhancing technology. And this is a, this is a large ethical debate as well. 
including talking about the ethics of elective treatment, um, whether, whether it is considered as uh, advantages in terms of performance, um, if, if it's not necessarily medically indicated. Uh, surprisingly, um, the, there's very little about the behavioral aspect, and this is not a good news for education. Uh, so far, a few papers around awareness, attitude, and prevalence, but talking about almost exclusively about boosting. And there's only one paper that was recently published looking at whether there's evidence for match fixing in para judo. Uh, the outcome of that, there didn't find any evidence. But at least the, the, the match fixing concept is coming into the para sport. I mentioned the boundaries. Um, Almost interestingly, when we move from anti-doping and including physical manipulation, classification manipulation, uh, we, technology, um, elective surgery, elective treatment, um, we are actually not addressing anti-doping issues per se, but we start talking about integrity issues and potentially threats to integrities. Uh, but then if we extend the scope of the review to that, um, do we have a right to limit the selection to papers that is actually focusing on, for the lack of the better word, done by the athletes? Or should we include papers that are actually talking about done to the athletes? So there are some which we didn't include it at the moment. There are uh, literature around uh, the, the risk uh, and, and the transpotetic issues to this vulnerable population. Um, Non-accidental violence, abuse, sexual abuse, and all that nasty part of the, the dark side of sport integrity. So it's a question where we draw the line, but uh, the positive side of that, that actually para sport anti-doping research more than the non-para sport research opened the door to sport integrity, which is which I think is the direction where we, we, we need to go. So I, I hope that it's, um, it at least was, if it's not a summary and not very informative, but at least it's a thought provoking for the discussion. Thanks, Andrea. Thank That's um, yeah, a really useful sort of um, introduction and to get started, um, and also gives people an idea of the pitch and and also highlights, I think, that um, that the specific um, requirements for education and key issues within para sport are not necessarily just the same as they are for um, non-disabled sport and i think that's an important um conclusion for us to draw from that but there are definitely some decisions for us to to make in terms of where we want to draw the line when we're when we're looking at clean sport and, and integrity and which areas we group together uh, and definitely something for for more extended discussion potentially um so i'll move on now to um to Ali and give him sort of a, a, an opportunity um, to sort of give his thoughts, but also you know, just ask for whether he could reflect on his experiences of anti-doping education today but as a Paralympic and international para-athlete over many years in terms of what he thinks that uh, you know, his experiences have been, but also you know, what the particular needs of, um, of para-athletes might be um, going forward. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, so I guess from, from my point of view and my experience, um, we know that para-athletes are subjected to the same standards as um, the Olympic sports when it comes to anti-doping itself. Um, however, the, when it comes to education, um, there, I think there is some differences in terms of um, scenario-based um, education when it comes to specific para-scenarios. So for example, um, with certain impairments, so like visually impaired or blind, um, that we know that they need chaperones just to make sure that the anti-doping process is actually conducted in a way that's that's fair on the athlete. Um, however, when it comes to education, that's not really put in the scenario-based stuff. Usually it's very generic. It focuses on the anti-doping rule violations um, and informed sports. Like, you know, so it's it doesn't focus on um, the para-specific elements to it. Um, athletes has, actually have to go and ask them questions specifically. So I think going forward, when it comes to education, um, it has to be more para specific um, going forward. Um, but I think if you talk to any para athlete, 
um, they'll probably talk to you about um, intentional misrepresentation and boosting in terms of um, there's, there's actually no education on that either. Um, it's whether or not you include that as part of the education, which is not in the what what is remit, or you um, use a framework with an anti-doping education and transfer it to, to, to para sports. But that's obviously a discussion we can have down the line. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, some some useful points I think for us to, to pick up on and discuss more as we go forward. I think one of the key things there is that, as you mentioned and as Andrea mentioned as well, is that. Um, for many power athletes, the minute you get talking about um, uh, integrity issues uh, and clean sport, some of these other issues are going to be raised. Um, so there's certainly going to be an opportunity to address those there. But obviously, practitioners that are delivering those sessions need to have the requisite knowledge and, uh, and background and, uh, and training to be able to answer and address those, those issues, but also to, to appreciate some of the specifics um, relating to um, uh, clean sport and anti-doping education for power athletes. So I think that'd be a useful um, point for us to sort of move over to, to Paul and, um, and get the practitioner's perspective, just in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of your experiences delivering uh, anti-doping and clean sport education with power athletes specifically, um, what is there some of the other things that you reflect upon um, from those experiences that suggest that there might be some uh, specific needs around power athletes. Yeah, I think, thanks very much, Jane. Um, I think Ali probably highlighted uh, one of the major issues that I would see in that, although particularly in Ireland, Paralympics Ireland would be very similar and analogous to a smaller national govern governing body of sport. And although the um, burden of testing is the same, the lack of resources available to the uh, those smaller NGBs or Paralympic Ireland is, is definitely very relevant. And I know if you were to go to any program in sport and you'd say, what are the biggest challenges? You know, resources is probably one that I'd highlight every single time, you know, be it human or physical. But for me, um, in terms of the, the implementation of an, an anti-doping education program, it's very important for me to find, first of all, the champions within those organizations that would be able to... to to really get the message out there, to find tutors that are that are equipped to understand not only what the anti-doping education program is, but also how it fits into the context of the Paralympic movement. So, for example, there's no sense in me training somebody to tutor on an anti-doping education program if they don't really understand what classification manipulation is, what, if they don't understand what boosting is, because whether it's part of the anti-doping program or not, it is still something that from when we've spoken to athletes, it's still something that they're going to talk about. So it's very important to try and find those people within the organizations to try and, you know, first of all, that they're, they're going to champion the message, but that they're able to engage with the athletes in order for them to be able to answer the questions that athletes are going to put to them, you know. Um, I suppose the other thing is, is that we say, like one of the cornerstones of the anti-doping program internationally is that, you know, that it should be athlete-centric, that an athlete's first experience of an anti-doping program should be education. And I think that that may be, we're getting closer. We're, we're by no means there in, in you know, non-para sport, but it's definitely not there in para sport. For instance, exactly what Ali said, I, I did a Zoom uh, session for the, the, the Paralympic Games and one of the visually impaired athletes said, came onto the session and said, did anybody else find that very difficult to, to actually view? Because that I just didn't have the technology available to, that was compatible with the software that that, that that visually impaired athlete was using. So it definitely is multifaceted. But I think I do think that we are starting to move in a direction that is more um, that we are increasing the accessibility. But we're, we're definitely not there yet. Thanks, Paul. That's uh, really helpful. And uh, yeah, I think that's a good conclusion. There is. That, um, uh, and similar in some ways to the conclusion in the, in the previous um, session that you know, we're moving in the right direction, but we're definitely not there yet. And I guess that's one of the aims of our overall projects, isn't it? To, is to try and inform um, education within this area. So, um, yeah, that's an important objective for us. Um, while we've been discussing those um, initial points, um, quite a few questions have come in from the audience. So that's really good. I'm just sort of working through those. I'm, 
I'm, I'm not necessarily doing them in the order that they come in, but I'm trying to pick the more the broader questions first and then we'll narrow down to some of the more specific ones um, as we move forward. Um, so the, the, there was a question came in from, from Claire Lane um, asking uh, to all the panelists potentially, in, in your opinion, is there a need for clean sport education to be tailored for para sport athletes that doesn't simply focus on adaptation to the testing procedures? And I think we've probably covered that to some degree, but then there's a follow up um, from Claire that then goes on to say, um, you know, it, specifically in terms of scenario based, um, it, it, when we're doing scenario based, value based, potentially education, do we need to tailor that specifically to um, the needs of power athletes? So I don't know who wants to um, answer that one first, but uh, Ali, you're probably quite keen, I would think. Yeah, so, so um, I think when it comes to clean sports, so the first question, um, we need a, an actual definition of what it is first. Uh, many athletes seem to have this perception of different levels of what it is. I think the system needs to do better in terms of defining that for athletes. Um, and then you can tell the education after that. But it's obviously something that has been worked on for many years and we still can't find an actual definition of it. Um, so I think for me, like, you know, does clean sport um, kind of involve IM and boosting with it? Or does it involve just substances? And at the moment, the system is just tailored on substance doping. Um, so I guess when it comes to a power sport element, um, I think if you talk to a lot of athletes, they would include the other methods with substance doping, but I don't know if the anti-doping system is ready for that yet. Um, and when it comes to scenario-based stuff, like definitely, um, I think athletes will only learn if it's related to them. Um, at the moment, it's very generic and athletes have to go find that information and it's not really transparent and, and um, easy accessible for them. So I think it's very important that if we want to educate para athletes, you need to be able to relate to their scenarios. And I think the only way to do that is to by speaking to the athletes because they have all the experiences um, to kind of inform that education process. Thanks, Ali. Um, uh, Andrea, Paul, do you want to pick up on any element of that in terms of the, the specific needs of para athletes? Yeah, I definitely think I, I totally agree with, with Ali. Um, to be honest, I think that's we're probably, even at, at the level of scenario-based education in non para sports, I still think that there's work to do. Um, so I definitely think that there's work to do in, in the para sports. One of the things that, that I really think is, um, is going to be vital over the next, coming, the next few years in terms of anti-doping education is the idea of this ethical decision-making, the values-based education. So where you're, you're actually doing those modules where it's not necessarily specific to a particular anti-doping rule violation or classification manipulation or anything like that. It's about education on um, a framework where you can in instill this idea that I'm going to make the right decision based on these different uh, ethical dilemmas. And I think that that's one of the things that would be very beneficial because again, you can specify or you can, you can make it specific to any of the different uh, scenarios that you're, that you're um, you know, implementing your education. So I think that that's one of the, the big things. And again, the values-based education, I mean, we should, I do, we do try where possible to try and give scenarios that are specific to the, to the forum that you're, you're dealing in. But again, we don't do enough for, in, in terms of the Paralympic sports, I don't think. Thanks, Paul. I think that's, you know, I think what we're highlighting there is the, the, the importance of having those specific scenarios that people do perceive relevance to, but there's definitely work needed, I think, in terms of developing those for, for power athletes. Um, so hopefully that's something that we can sort of um, inform through our projects over the coming year or two. Um, just to sort of move on to a different question, there's one that's um, specific, quite specific to you um, and Andrea. Because um, I realise you didn't get a chance to answer that last one. It says, um, you know, where do you see is the biggest gap in the literature when it comes to doping in Paris sport, which might be quite a, a, a big gap or a big question. But it says, uh, I guess the follow up to that is what research would you like to see occurring? So I guess that's a little bit, you can be a bit more specific if you answer the, the second one, whereas it might take a while to answer the first one. I, I think the, the gap is, I can answer the very short, uh, in a short way, gap is everywhere. Um, 
at the moment, any research you do in, in para sports is unique and publishable. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that it's always valuable and the most useful. What I would like to see um, is evidence based behind the putative problems. Uh, and it's I'm not negating any of them that was raised in the literature uh, or by the panel discussion. But I would challenge anyone to find a publication in non para sports that doesn't start with the sentence that doping is a big problem, doping is widespread, doping is increasing. Uh, the evidence, whether we like it or not, is either not there or actually point to the direction that it's the most evidence is somewhere around the 10%. It goes up to 20. Uh, now we are just starting to see evidence for the prevalence of doping and the prevalence of different types of doping uh, emerging. But we are actually trying to address the problem for 20 years without actually understanding the magnitude of the problem or the nature of the problem. So what I would like to see first is actually looking at the problem, identifying the size of it and the nature of it. Um, as you see in my map, there are several ones that we can discuss and research. And once we actually know what we're dealing with, then try to find the solution for that rather than following the same route in as we did in anti-doping that we, we had the solution first and then we, we still try to identify the problem. Yeah, th thanks, Andrea. I, I think one of the, when we were sort of um, preparing this panel discussion, one of the key things that we uh, would like to see is that um, the sort of 20 plus years of, um, uh, of social science research in non-disabled sport, we could learn some of the lessons from that so we can shortcut get into very good answers um, in, in the research within parasport um, by learning from some of that. So I think that um, what you say there's got real relevance to that. Um, just moving on to another question that's come in. This is from uh, Scott Murray. So hi, Scott. Um, and he says, uh, uh, it says from the panel's experience and research, but I would think this one might be um, suited to Ali in terms of experiences, is how well are athletes looked after um, in doping control? So if we're thinking about our athletes and people with um, specific um, uh, impairments, disabilities, um, what would you say to that one in terms of how well athletes are looked after, power athletes? So, so from, from my um, experience, um, the DCOs are very well trained. Uh, for every scenario because they have to be just in case anything happens but that's weird because the, the athlete actually some athletes don't know what they're doing in that process um and a lot of it's new to them and that's where the education comes in um so it, was, it feels like the dco is guiding them through something where it's still new to many athletes especially internationally uh where the education for new para athletes is lacking um so the dco will explain kind of you know, kind of what we'll asked the para athletes any questions in terms of, you know, do they need to adapt it in any way for them? So they ask the right questions, but the para athletes themselves still don't kind of know themselves because um, it, one, it's rather get tested, uh, and two, because the um, education is lacking in terms of scenario based, um, like testing, para testing, um, they actually don't know what they require. Uh, so actually, um, that is a huge kind of issue there in terms of how early do you educate para-athletes, but also um, the lack of testing in para-sport because the lack of resources. So everything kind of falls down to resource and um, the education part, but yeah, um, DCOs, in my opinion, have been pretty good because they're trained for it, but a huge gap between what para-athletes know and what DCO, DCOs know. So um, yeah, so I think it's also all about kind of testing experience. So someone like me, I get tested like quite frequently, um, but, some sports that are not considered high risk um, don't get tested as much, but unfortunately, some of them have the impairments that actually require them to have an adapted testing process. So, yeah, there's there's a big gap there. Thanks, Ali. And we've got a, a couple of other questions that I think would relate to your response there. So, one of them was asking whether you know uh, you see any disparities in anti-doping across sports. So, does weightlifting hold weightlifters to a different standard? You you mentioned there in terms of high risk sports. So, I guess. Is, is something you might want to touch upon in there, but also um, uh, thanks to Michelle uh, Broken for the question as well, in terms of um, to asking who is responsible for verifying the person used as a para athlete representative. 
uh, and what impact do power athletes have on guidelines uh, around the, the, uh, the DCOs um, and, and representatives? So anything that you want to sort of follow up on on those two questions? Yeah, so the, the first one, um, we see that because of the lack of resource, um, a lot of it is targeted testing. Um, so the high risk sports like, like powerlifting um, will get tested more than a skills based, skills based uh, sport. Um, so I know a lot of um, skills based athletes don't actually get tested at all um, when I speak to them. Um, they don't even know what whereabouts is. Um, and that's also qu quite a big issue, quite a big shock for me, actually. Um, um, regarding the second question, so um, from my experience, the para athlete will have a kind of a chaperone that they pick that they're comfortable with to guide them through that anti doping process. Um, the issue, obviously, um, when they're out of competition is if that chaperone's unavailable um, and they're not there at that time they're getting tested, what happens? Um, obviously, they can't reject the test, so they're going to have to either do it and just hope that the DCO does everything right, um, or they um, try and get somebody random to come in and help them. Um, and, that, and that's where the, the real issue is for me, because scenarios like this are not thought of in the process, uh, especially with real education. Um, so I know one parent athlete who's visually impaired, they have their next door neighbor as their chaperone. So when they get uh, tested, literally the next door neighbor comes around and makes sure that everything's done for them. Um, the issue is, is whether or not it's an out, a random out of competition test where it's not in the designated slot and the next door neighbor is not there. Um, that's something that has to be dealt with at the time. Um, and I guess it's just things like that, that concern me because do you penalize you know, a visually impaired person for not being comfortable um, that they're getting tested and they need somebody there um, because they have to take the test, they can't refuse it. So it's just little things like that where the system is really inflexible when it comes to sanctioning and kind of, you know, it could actually be a disaster. Um, obviously it's never happened yet, but I think there'll be cases in the future where this has to be thought about. And I don't think the system is flexible enough to um, consider it because according to the rules, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a refusal. So um, anything can happen from that sort of scenario. Great, thanks, Ali. Yeah, I think what we're starting to see is that there's there some very specific issues that are obviously going to to be raised for power athletes, but also are likely to come up in education sessions where you know people need to be able to sort of answer and address these concerns. Um, and not all of them relate to, to doping, but obviously some of them relate to the testing process as well. Um, I just want to sort of move direction slightly because there, there, there was something that um, I wanted to ask about that. Um, it hasn't come up in the, the, the questions that we've had from the audience so far, but I think it's very important from, to consider um, uh, in terms of how we deliver education um, to power athletes. And, and this is um, in terms of, you know, do we think that power athlete, uh, sorry, clean spot education for power athletes should be delivered um, based on impairment category? Uh, and the, the, that specific disability rather than by sport uh, as anti-doping education is often delivered now. Um, so I'll probably go to, to Paul first with that one. Um, I, I definitely do think that it's important that when we're delivering the education that we are aware of the form, the, the form in which we're delivering it. So we definitely do need, if, it, if there are a particular cohort of athletes that you're delivering to, you do need to be aware of the, the impairment categories. The risk I think is that if you go too far down a particular, you know, if you, if you go too far down that road, that you may overemphasize an issue that may not necessarily be as big as it, as it like if you emphasize it too much, the, 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 it's almost, in, there's an almost implication there and it, it's implying that it's a bigger issue maybe than it, than it is. So I think it's important to have almost that whole piece whole where you deliver the specific impairment categories as part of an overall broader anti-doping education program rather than specifically going down that impairment category route because it, you, you may overemphasize issues that may not necessarily be issues. Thanks, Paul. And, uh, and the same question to, to Andrea and, and then to Ali, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think there's the potential value in, uh, in delivering that way? Um, I, I don't think it probably Ali will have a, a longer answer, so I will be quick. Um, 
I don't necessarily agree with Paul that it's not about the specific issues we need to address, but, but I think anti-doping organizations and whoever is responsible for delivering anti-doping education has to take a hard look at how accessible the information is. Um, what support is provided for athletes with different disabilities and limitations to, to actually get the education that is necessary to be compliant. So I'm, I'm just thinking about the very, very basic. And I look at, just out of curiosity, I looked at the guidance for the international standards and para-athletes per se does not come up. Uh, how to, I'm, I'm thinking about very, very easily, someone with learning disabilities, how accessible anti-doping education and the anti-doping code to someone with learning disability someone with visual impairment, that, that's, I, I can go on and on. So it's not necessarily the specific issue that is specific to for a sports such as, uh, such as boosting, but how to make or how to support athletes to, to access the basic information and, and how disenfranchised they, they feel if they actually try to have access, but they can't. Yeah. There is, a, there is, an, there is another research agenda there. <laughs> <laughs> looking at how does it make athletes feel and whether they feel they belong to the system or not. Yeah, I, I guess you'll get different opinions and you have different debates on you know, the best way of delivering. But I think one of the key things, whichever form of delivery is making sure that we've got that accessibility um, for, for everyone within Parasport. And I guess that's the, the risk is that if we don't look at particular classifications, then it's, it's possible that we're not um, serving everyone equally. Uh, Ali, any thoughts? Um, I think I, I, I agree with Andrea. Um, I think the the system at the moment isn't as accessible as I like it to be when it comes to power sport. Um, and, and because it's so generic and we just kind of transfer kind of the Olympic education to power education, um, even, though they, even though individual sports have to adhere to the same standard, some of them impairments struggle because they have kind of questions about their, their, their like impairment when it comes to that process. So I think, firstly, on the ground, if para-athletes have more accessibility when it comes to just finding information, I think that would be quite good so they can learn themselves. But when it comes to education, I think the way to tailor it, the easiest way to tailor it, probably the most cost-efficient way, is actually look at like um, national performance centres and go, right, what para-sports are here and what impairments have we got here? Um, can the sports kind of have education together, but with very similar impairments, so we can actually run these sessions um, and have more scenario-based sessions rather than just the sport? Because we know sports are, they have, they have to adhere to the same standards, but we can actually focus on the actual need of the para-athlete and the impairment rather than the bulk of the um, generic information. Um, so I think we should definitely look at national hubs and see what para-sports are based out of there and what impairments are there. Um, to kind of tailor that to, to the programs. But I guess um, that, that would take a lot of effort from probably the N, N kind of NG, NGBs and probably, you know, UCAD as well, so to make sure that can happen. Thanks, Ali. So, so possibly uh, maybe an uh, amalgam amalgamation of the two where we're, we're looking at particular impairments, but within sports, so sort of to capitalise on the fact that people are in one space, but also to make sure we're tailoring it uh, specifically to, to um, people with certain uh, impairments. So I'm just um, I, I'm just looking at the time. We're sort of moving towards the end of the session, and we did have um, uh, there's one final question that I wanted to ask each of you uh, in turn. Um, so you've got roughly uh, one to two minutes to answer this this one each. But I'll start with Paul because I think it's the longest since Paul got to answer a question. So. If there was one thing you could change about clean sport education within Parasport right now, what would it be? Again, just similar to what has just been said, it'd definitely be accessibility. So, um, and I suppose it, they're, not, they're not totally independent of each other. It's about better use of the resources that we have because everybody says that resources are an issue, but I, I still don't think that we use the resources that we have to the best of our ability. So, it's, and I, I suppose they're both both very uh, strongly linked. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Andrea? 
Uh, in para sports and non para sports, I would like to see a more holistic approach in anti-doping education or more like education that consider anti-doping rule violations as part of an integrity and addressing all other threats of integrity issues along the same umbrella, because I, I struggle with separating values-based education that's specific to anti-doping and not addressing the other integrity issues. Thanks, Andrew. And, and just sort of to, to pick up on that, obviously we're talking here specifically on, mainly about um, uh, power athlete re and research on, uh, within power athletes. But uh, in terms of that separation, do you see uh, a potential benefit of bringing together, so conducting research with power athletes and non-disabled athletes within the same projects, or is the benefit in separating them out? Uh, question to me. Yeah, yeah, still to you. I was just picking up on something that you said. In, um, I guess it depends on the research question. There are specific issues that, again, bringing up boosting or classification manipulation that is, is very, very specific to uh, para sports. Although I could draw the parallel with classification manipulation, the, the weight category manipulation with, with normal sports. So, so in some cases, probably there, there's a combination. Um, in... In reality, what I would like to see is, which is a long range of the, the long term plan, is often you see in the research that they are including, I'm talking about mainly quant uh, quantitative research when they have a sur survey samples and they reporting or um, testing. And you, you know from the paper that is including para athletes and, and non para athletes together. Um, I really would like to see researchers reporting the important outcome variables, whatever it is, prevalence or attitude or knowledge, doesn't matter what, to report it separately. Uh, maybe the, your sample size is very, very small, but ultimately in 10 years time, someone will come along and try to pull all of these low evidence pieces together and do a review. But it's only possible to do if it's, if it's reported separately. So, I, I don't try to artificially separate the two because I, I really think that the majority of the issues are similar. It's breaking the rules, it's integrity is the same in para sports and non para sports. But to facilitate further research, I think sometimes it would be helpful to artificially separate actually the two and report, even if the, the main purpose of the paper is not comparing or contrasting the two, but just to facilitate further research down the road. Maybe it's 10 years time, but it will be useful. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I think probably uh, just drawing a conclusion from something you said that I think that relates to, to all areas of research and, and probably one of the limitations in the, in the literature for non-disabled sport and clean sport uh, in, in the research today is making sure that we're specifically matching our samples and the, the populations that we're sampling from for the research questions that we're answering. I think too often people um, possibly because of resource or, 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 um, sampling from convenience samples when that's not suitable for the research question and maybe, um, and, and obviously that relates to, uh, to Parasport as well. So there are specific questions where combining samples would make sense, but there are also questions that would it make sense to, to separate out. So yeah, a very good answer. And um, Ali, before, um, before you go to the final question, sorry to interrupt, before you go to the final questions for, for Paul and Ali, there is a question about educational resources for visually impaired and intellectually impaired athletes. I don't know. Yeah, I, did, I, I, did say, I, I, I might take that one right at the end, just because we're sort of midway through people's wish list in terms of what okay. we would like to see change. So, um, yeah, go on. I, I think there's only Ali left. So. But what would you like? What would you change right now, Ali, if you could? Oh, um, I think at the moment, um, probably. Um, I, I think they they always say that the Paralympic Games is parallel to the Olympics. They always promote it as that. Um, I want the Paralympic Games or para sport to be treated the same way within anti-doping. So same resource, same number of tests, more research within para sport and anti-doping. Um, so we can actually respect it more because uh, if you can say it's parallel, um, show it that respect and actually invest in it uh, rather than, um, you know, we know that anti-doping in para sport is very new, but I think now with the how popular it is, um, it's definitely got the 
uh, the money there to, to probably invest in in trying to protect it. Uh, and I think athletes do deserve that. Um, but yeah, if I, that's the one thing I'd probably change is the resource and the respect that it should get with an anti-doping. Thanks, Ali. And I think uh, across everyone's answers today, we've seen the uh, the importance of, of, of resource being an important um, element if we want to deliver high quality education. So good to see that highlighted again there. So yeah, we did have this one further question. So I don't know if anyone wants to try and answer that one in the one minute that we have remaining. But um, yeah, what about education resources for visually impaired and intellectually impaired athletes? I don't know, Paul, maybe from your practitioner perspective, anything you want to say on that quickly? Yeah, but I suppose that I, there hasn't been an, an, a lot done for us in, in particularly for uh, visual impairment and intellectual impairment. I know that there is obviously the, the Adele platform that was released in, I think it was the start of this year, where they did have um, a resource there that for, for visually impaired athletes. But again, it's an e-learning course rather than something that's, you know, the scenario-based stuff that, that we really want to be getting to. So there probably, there isn't enough there at the moment, I suppose. So unfortunately, I can't really say enough about it because it is something that we need to resource more um, more heavily. Thanks, Paul. And uh, yeah, and uh, thanks to Andrea and Ali as well for your uh, responses. Hopefully the audience have found that interesting. I certainly have. And um, yeah, and thanks to the audience for all the questions that came in as well. We, we tried to answer as many of them uh, as we could whilst also addressing some of the other issues that we were keen to highlight in the session. So, um, yeah, well, uh, um, thanks everyone, and uh, we'll hand back to Charlie now. Thank you very much indeed, Ian, and uh, yeah, thank you very much to, to Andrea, uh, Paul, and Ali as well. It's been a, a fascinating discussion, and um, I thank you all as well for, for, for putting your questions on the, uh, the Q&A um function there as well it's been uh, it's been a really good session we're going to uh, keep on just moving straight on to the uh, to the next session now um uh, delighted to, to welcome mario who is uh, the uh, head of intelligence and investigations here at ucad so a um, another fascinating part of, uh, of the work that ucad does um and uh, mario is going to uh, give us a bit of an insight into how ucad uses intelligence in a in a very specific sort of law enforcement uh, term um, to keep sport clean. So uh, I'll hand uh, straight over to you, Mario. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Charlie. I'm just share my screen. Um, can anyone uh, can anyone see that? Oh, hang on. Yeah, you're good to go, Mario. Yeah. Okay. So, um, thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to uh, uh, to give this presentation. Um, I'm very uh, um, thankful to uh, uh, Dr. Ian um, uh, Brogley and uh, uh, his team at uh, uh, the University of Birmingham, and also uh, uh, for Sue Backhouse uh, and her team at uh, Leeds Beckett because. Um, I'm enthralled with the, uh, uh, the data and the research that they've conducted, which has helped us immensely to uh, uh, create the Protect Your Sport um, platform. Um, as I say, I'm the head of intelligence and, and investigation here at UCAD. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk to you uh, today about uh, um, intelligence at UCAD, um, a bit of an introduction. Um, also, uh, the barriers to reporting uh, doping in sport, and we've heard uh, some of those uh, already. Um, some of the uh, research, and also a little bit about the uh, Protect Your Sport campaign. Um, and then finally, uh, talk about the uh, uh, recent whistleblowing policy um, that is uh, live. So, um, you know, how does UCAD uh, use intelligence? Um, well, um, what does that mean? Well, the intelligence uh, team continue to maintain strong partnerships um, with various uh, public sector agencies, such as uh, the National Crime Agency, uh, Drugs and Firearms Licensing and Compliance Unit, Home Office, um, the MHRA, uh, General Medical Council, and I could 
stream a whole load of, uh, uh, of other agencies. Um, we also engage with Interpol and Europol. Um, so we're quite wide breaching with our, uh, our partnership. And they all assist us in uh, gathering the intelligence uh, that we require. And some of this intelligence um, will be fed into the test di distribution program to assist targeted testing of athletes. We also use the intelligence to target, target and educate athletes and ASPs um, that are identified as lacking um, the knowledge of how, where, and when to report their concerns. We share intelligence uh, packages with our partner agencies, uh, some of which I've uh, identified, and this is to embark on a joint operation uh, or deploy disruption tactics to dissuade doping. We also gather information to create uh, sport and substance profiles, which include the sports that are highlighted as high risk, which we've spoken about um, today, uh, coupled with identifying the prohibited substances of choice for those sports. We also carry out strategic threat assessments and conduct horizon scanning um, to ascertain the current doping trends and methodology used to dope. Moving on to the barriers uh, to uh, uh, doping in sport, um, again, through the research uh, that the universities have uh, um, embarked on, it's given us a valuable insight into why there is such a low take up on report, uh, reporting doping in sport. My team at UCAD realised uh, that through this research, uh, there is a lack of awareness and understanding of whistleblowing uh, and the process. Um, and it's predominantly, um, you know, a UCAD problem and one that we need to, uh, to work with uh, other um, teams. Uh, and to, the, to that end, um, we've uh, worked with our education team to develop training modules to educate athletes and ASP on the whistleblowing process in order to promote and engender an environment of reporting wrongdoing, because ultimately it's the right thing to do. With regard to uh, um, some of the research that's been carried out, um, it was found that athletes who competed in team sports were less likely to blow the whistle on their colleagues than those who competed in uh, uh, individual sports. This was attributed uh, to the feeling of loyalty to their team colleagues and the sport. Also concerns regarding repercussions in sport from their peers, especially where the sport is a small community of players and staff. And in some cases, a general feeling of helplessness to stop doping. And perhaps the biggest barrier faced by UCAD is the inability to follow up on anonymous intelligence. Very few people leave their contact details. And this renders us to, uh, unable to uh, follow up on that intelligence. It prevents my team from further developing that information to a level that is uh, actionable. In many cases, that information is single strand, uncorroborated, and thus difficult to ascertain in, uh, with regard to its credibility. This is why the Protect Your Sport uh, platform promotes confidential reporting over anonymous reporting. This is a dynamic shift in our current practices. You'll hear me um, continue uh, throughout this presentation um, and say um, that um, we will keep the whistleblower's identity in the strictest confidence and will protect that premise at all costs if they, if they are acting uh, in good faith and have not given false or malicious information. This slide depicts uh, the results of a survey um, on athletes and coaches. The three key areas demonstrate uh, the inhibiting factors to reporting doping in sport. And as you can see, the first box is around capability uh, and the lack of awareness and understanding of the safeguards, processes, and programs um, that are in place for whistleblowing. And there's an example there of 40% of coaches, <coughs> excuse me, and 35% of athletes agreed 
that they know what safeguards are in place for them to report doping. Where in the INI team, um, through presentations such as this, um, trying to work closely with our communications team to embark on a wide reach of media campaign, uh, promoting the Protect Your Sport platform and encouraging people to report doping in sport. And with regard to the second box opportunity, there is uh, in general um, a feeling that athletes and coaches are not encouraged to report doping by their sport. Uh, or they're unaware of individuals who have reported so that that would encourage uh, further reporting. And also the reaction to those uh, who speak up um, is discour discouraging. And that's uh, another example. There are 45% of coaches and 38% of athletes surveyed felt their sport actively encouraged them to, uh, to report doping. Through um presentations such as this and by working closely um you know we're trying to bring the opportunity to report doping um you know to uh, uh to the audience and the last um box talks about um uh, the motivation um and that there is worry and anxiety associated with reporting and this take takes uh responsibility for ending sorry taking the responsibility for ending an athlete's career that's that's a big ask of anyone giving information that they could end that athlete's career and also looking at uh, the professional career and financial implications coaches um of 93 percent of coaches and 83 percent of uh, uh athletes generally feel it's their responsibility to report doping in sports. So that goes with um, what you've already heard today. So protect your sport is both supportive and, and challenging. You know, we're dedicated here at UK uh, to uh, um, look at uh, uh, going towards clean competition. But we know that we can't do it alone and uh, uh, it takes a team to do so and that's just not UK that's everyone else involved in the sporting community protecting clean sport depends on everyone doing their part whether they're center stage or whether they're behind the scenes and it rests on everyone athletes coaches parents support staff having the know-how to speak out when something's wrong no matter how, sp uh, how small it could be the last piece in the jigsaw um, to enable the bigger picture to come into focus. That's what we uh, that's what we need. I want to encourage uh, an ethos to say it's okay to report doping, <clears throat> that your anonymity will be protected, that we will take all information, evaluate it, assess it, and where possible corroborate that information. And what's the end result? Well, once we've done that um, and we deem it appropriate to do so, we will act on that in, uh, that material to either feed into our intelligence led testing program, prosecute any athletes or support personnel found to have committed uh, any identified analytical or non analytical anti doping rule violations, or we will carry out disruption measures to dissuade any further doping activity where the threshold for prosecution is not met or deemed not in the public interest to pursue. Throughout the process, we will continue to protect the source of the information. Again, I'm trying to stress this all th throughout this uh, presentation. I need to get this home and where appropriate, we would keep them up to date on the progress of that inquiry uh, and investigation. We can't always do that, um, but in the majority of the cases, we'll strive to do that. And it is because of uh, this shift in focus uh, that we have been able uh, to develop more intelligence to a level that is actionable. So since the beginning of the Protect Your Sport campaign in November 2020, which has been a collaborative uh, approach with our communications team, UCAD has received 46 reports of misconduct in sport via the Protect Your Sport channels 
reports were from across 21 different sports that we reported on. 20% of reports received relate to tier one sport and six sports account for 63% of all reports. Individual sports account for 61% uh, of all reports. I just want to move on now to um, the whistleblowing policy and just give you a distinction between an informant and a whistleblower. An informant can make a disclosure of alleged misconduct to UCAD anonymously and in confidence at any time. Informants are not subject to the additional rights and protections afforded to a whistleblower. And I'll go into those in a little bit more detail later on in this presentation. With regard to the whistleblower, similar, a whistleblower can make a disclosure of alleged misconduct at any time and enters into a signed agreement with us. And this agreement provides additional rights and protections, and this is where it changes from an informant. And let me give you um, some examples of the whistleblower's rights. Um, the right to maintain contact with and seek advice from a designated person within my team, the intelligence and investigations team. And where appropriate to receive updates on how any investigation arising from the whistleblower disclosure is progressing. And also where appropriate to be notified of the outcome and findings of the, any investigation relating to the whistleblower's disclosure of alleged misconduct. And again, I've put the rider on that, that we cannot always do that. But also to uh, uh, maintain contact with the uh, designate person uh, in the intelligence and investigations team after an investigation has concluded, especially in relation to matters concerning the maintenance of their anonymity. But we also expect from the whistleblower um, to have the responsibilities and they must make a disclosure of misconduct in good faith with an honestly held belief that the disclosure is accurate and made on reasonable grounds. And also immediately inform the intelligence and investigations team if they or any other person is in danger or at risk of reprisals resulting from the informant's contact with UCAD. We also uh, um, would um, expect the whistleblower to provide accurate information to the intelligence and investigations team and where appropriate, clarify information and consider providing further information if it's required. And they must comply with terms, the terms and conditions set out in the whistleblower's agreement and not comment on any anti-doping rule violations, sorry, and not commit any anti-doping rule violations or any other act or omission, which could undermine any ongoing or future investigation. And they should seek approval from the uh, intelligence and investigations team before doing any act that is any way related to an ongoing investigation. And this is the most important part of this agreement. They should maintain strict confidentiality at all times and to take all reasonable steps to protect their anonymity in accordance with the whistleblower agreement. This responsibility remains applicable even after uh, an investigation has concluded. Any breach of confidentiality by the whistleblower will terminate the whistleblower agreement and result in a loss of whistleblower rights, uh, as already mentioned. The whistleblower policy um, is on our uh, UCAD website um, if you want to have a more detailed look at it. Anyone can seek advice from the intelligence and investigations team at UCAD at any time. And providing information to UCAD does not mean you will have to give evidence or that you will be identified as a whistleblower. And again, what I must stress is that you know, maintaining the confidentiality of information and the anonymity of a whistleblower is key and of the utmost importance to UCAD. We want to keep your identity confidential. You may ask, 
well, what can we do if uh, there is retaliation against whistleblowers? Well, there's a new article in the World Anti-Doping Code, uh, the 2021 code under uh, 2.11, which provides a new anti-doping rule violation, which says acts by an athlete or other person to discourage or retaliate against reporting to authorities. And we will use that article uh, against anyone um, that challenges uh, or uh, disrupts any athlete giving uh, information uh, to us. There are other laws um, of the United Kingdom um, that can be inv uh, invoked, um, protections against behaviours such as harassment and malicious communications. And where appropriate, um, we will assist the whistleblower in making a report to the police or other appropriate authority, um, reporting to uh, agencies outside the UK, um, outside of UCAD, will necessitate the whistleblower disclosing their identity to the other agent, agency for obvious reasons. And there is also the Public Interest Disclosure Act of 98, which provides employees with protection from retribution by their employer. Okay, um, I fired that at you uh, um, quite quickly, um, trying to get uh, uh, within the time. Um, I'd like to show you now a, a, a quick video uh, which sets out our stall more eloquently than, uh, than I can. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you very much for uh, um, taking the time to uh, listen and uh, uh, happy to take any questions. Over to you, Emily. Yeah, so we have had one question come in and it relates to um, the whistleblower idea. And the person is suggesting, what about if there was uh, a go-between between the whistleblower and the community? So. Would it be easier for people to report their concerns to somebody they know who then passes it on to somebody like you, Cad? So the reason they're asking that question is apparently there's a similar um, process in the state relating to a clean needle exchange program. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that general idea. Yeah, I mean, we have um, actually uh, um, done something similar. Uh, where um, we've engaged uh, with an in-between in um, and they have been the conduit between the whistleblower or informant um, and our team. Um, and that's worked well. Um, in that 
particular instance um, because the go between um, saw that we were professional in relation to the confidentiality side and that we would keep um, the anonymity. Um, we eventually spoke to uh, uh, the whistleblower um, and everything uh, was kept to a confidential basis and, and we had a good result from that. Um, we're always open to uh, anything. We don't we want we want the information to come to us um and in the past we've used crime stoppers and it's a very good um medium for us um, but we've moved on to um other platforms such as protect your sport um which you know has been a uh, a success as well as crime stoppers as well um so yeah we would consider that too Right, yeah, really interesting suggestion from somebody there. And um, just a more basic question, actually, from Terence O'Rourke is how, how many people are in your team? Do you want to maybe yeah. explain a little bit about how the team um, uh, is created and, you know, the different elements you've got within the team? Sure. Um, the dy dynamics of the, uh, the team, if I go through um, the head count, if you like, we uh, currently have two um, researchers that carry out, <clears throat> as you would expect, the research, uh, and that could be uh, online, it could be with uh, other agencies, um, where they pull um, the information together, um, get it into um, some semblance of order from all the different sources. And I think you've got to remember that, you know, it doesn't just come from the Protect Your Sport platform or other agencies. It comes from a various um, amount, the powers, power of 10, which we'd use to uh, look at the performance side. Um, researchers then would um, pass that on to um, our um, Intel analyst. Um, our Intel analyst then would work that up to, um, you know, a, a, a package. Um, and we would then um, ask our intelligence uh, coordinator and our se senior intelligence coordinator um, to evaluate, assess that piece of intelligence. And if it um, passes the criteria that we set, then we'd look at packaging that um, to go out to our investigators to uh, investigate that particular uh, uh, set of circumstances and possibly embark on, um, you know, prosecuting uh, uh, that athlete or uh, doing a disruption. Now, we have three investigators um, and you can see by that, um, you know, that we uh, are, are clearly uh, quite busy in relation to uh, uh, intelligence that comes in that need to be uh, uh, further looked at. Um, yeah, and then, um, you know, the Intel coordinators would um, look at all quarters, they look at stakeholder management, um, so that we can go out to our stakeholders. And it's a two way street. So we would share intelligence um, to um, to our stakeholders and we would also uh, obtain intelligence so that we can act upon, upon that. We have a very good relationship with the National Crime Agency uh, and police forces up and down the, uh, uh, the country um, and obviously uh, we utilise uh, um, that to good end. Right. That answers um, the question. Well, in the total number in the other team, I think it's nine. Is that right? Nine. Or Sorry, yeah, yeah, it yeah. is nine. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the. It was a great explanation, but I think that was also the number they're looking for. <laughs> is um any other questions anybody would like to put to Mario? Um, I don't think so. So thanks very much, Mario, for your presentation. That's really useful. I'm just thanks. going to um wrap up the day now. So um really interesting set of sessions we've had today uh we've been able to i guess look at a few issues really in depth and as we know it always brings out something um really interesting that you'd love to spend more time on i think the cbd um session uh that we went with first with professor graham close really opens up the myriad of complexities in that issue and how careful we must be if we're advising athletes around uh, that particular um, substance. Always remember that our mantra at UCAD when it comes to supplements is food first, take a food first approach and assess the need and assess, assess the risk. And clearly today we learn about the number of risks there are with this um, particular substance. And also, yes, just interesting to confirm what Professor Graham Close said, 
is that yesterday WADA announced that they are going to look again at cannabis in terms of its position on the prohibited list, but that won't make any changes this year or during 2022. So nothing is about to immediately change. Um, and thank you to our academic experts um, led by Dr. Ian Bordley, um, looking at the evaluation projects that have been going on in um, um, values led education. And as you know, from what I said earlier and yesterday, insight, innovation, maximizing the use of research is really important to us at UCAD. It's a central theme in our strategic plan. We're looking for more people to collaborate with, uh, to bring in knowledge and ultimately improve our programs and their effectiveness across the board. An excellent round table that we've had with our guests. Thank you to Andrea, Paul and Ali for joining us. Um, really great to get into some of those um, particular issues relating to para-athlete um, and para-athlete sports personnel, which I think probably uh, can often be overlooked. And thanks again to Mario for bringing us information about the intelligence approach that we're taking and the way we're trying to increase knowledge and information. If, and if you have anything that you think might be of interest to us, please try out those channels and send it through. Uh, you might think it's quite insignificant, but actually it might be the final piece in the puzzle for us in terms of putting together um, our, our programme. So uh, thanks for joining us. As you can see from the slide that's up at the moment, this is um, just one event that we've been holding today. We're holding another one in October on the 12th and 13th of October. This is uh, an event called Clean Sport Forum. This has got a slightly different focus. This is our effectively our annual conference from UCAD, looking particularly at um, those people who are working within anti-doping at national governing bodies in the UK. We'll be talking about our assurance framework, the criteria of compliance that we've put in place for sports and other particular issues that um, people at all levels of an NGB should be very um, concerned about when it comes to anti-doping. So put those dates in your diary and visit the website to register for those. So um, unless we have any further questions, then uh, thanks to all of our panelists and um, we'll see you at the next event.